Do you enjoy the drama of a good relationship story? Or judging whether or not someone is an asshole? Then you should check out the Reddit on Wiki podcast where I, Josh Shell, and my co-hosts, John and Sean, react to some of the craziest stories we can find on Reddit. From terrible relationship stories to crazy mother-in-laws, we cover it all every Monday and Friday. So subscribe to Reddit on Wiki on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, bring the tea. We are, we are, we are cultivate, 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 cultivate. We are cultivate. Hello and welcome to Yield Crime where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stengel. Hello. Hi. How's it going? It's going. It is. Would you like to tell our listeners where you are recording from this episode? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I recently moved, and I have not found the right space and so i thought for this episode i would test my harry potter bathroom so if the audio is a little bit different this week that is why yep that's why all right this is the last episode of black history month and i kind of saved the biggest one for last really it beats last week's i mean in a sense it kind of depends on what, you know. What you consider to be big? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm ready. So this week, we are going to be discussing the Dahomey Warriors. They sound nice. Probably not nice to certain people, but. <laughs> yeah. We'll get into it. All right. All right. Information was pulled from the following sources. A 2022 Atlas Obscura article by Line Sidoni Tala Mafatsing. I am so sorry if I said your name wrong. That was a lot. And I know I screwed it up right off the bat. Just <laughs> cracking open that cubby. A 2022 Insider article by Yoon Ji Han. 2022 National Geographic article by Rachel Jones. 2022 Smithsonian Magazine article by Mylon Solly, 2020 The Best of Africa article by Veronica Mwanza, 2020 Guardian Life article by Michelle Bombadel, 2018 BBC Travel article by Fleur McDonald, 1993 Paiduma article by Robin Law, the AAREG website, UNESCO Women in Africa History page, and 12 Wikipedia links. Dang, 12? Yeah. That's a thorough page. Good mm-hmm. on them. Mm-hmm. And links to all these articles will be included in the show notes. Got something you want to say? Shoot us an email over at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story ideas, see any gifts you send our way, or if you just want to say hello. We're pretty friendly. Speaking of friendly... If you'd like to have real-time conversations with us, consider joining our Discord over at the Cultivate Network. You can chat with us over at the Old Crimers Cubby, or catch up with any of the other great creators that are part of the Cultivate family of podcasts. Just click the link in our show notes, or over on our link tree to get started today. If you're a Marvel fan, specifically Black Panther, you're probably familiar with Fedora Malahe the group of elite female warriors from the technologically advanced imaginary nation of Wakanda. Wakanda forever. (laughs) But what would you say if I told you that they were based on a real group of female fighters? That's really badass, and I like that a lot. Known as the Mino, which means our mothers, Agoji, Black Spartans, or Dahomey Amazons, These female warriors were a formidable army that defended what is now the present-day Republic of Benin, 
They are also the only all-female military force in history. That's incredible. Yeah. The Black Spartans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. If you saw, like, illustrations of them, and even photos, because there were photos towards the end. Nice. They were pretty scary looking. Like, I wouldn't yeah. want to run into them in battle. No way. That's awesome. I'm going to continue to refer to them by their preferred name of Mino, even okay. though in modern culture, they are often referred to by the name that the Europeans gave them, wow. which is the Dahomey Amazons. And in a lot of articles, they were also referred to as the Agoji. But they liked Mino. But they liked Mino. So I was going to go based off of what their preferred name was. Wow, what a novel concept. <laughs> what? <laughs> You're using a preferred name? Wow. How modern. How modern of me. <laughs> a history podcast. <laughs> their exact origins are unknown, but the kingdom of Dahomey existed from around 1600 to 1904 and played a huge part in the trade in West Africa during the 18th and 19th centuries. According to the National Geographic article, quote, the kingdom established a well-organized government in which the king was considered semi-divine and had absolute control over economic, political, and social affairs. He was supported by a council of officials chosen from the commoner class because of their allegiance to the king and commitment to the nation's development, end quote. So not just like an absolute monarchy. Yeah. It's unclear when exactly the Mino became an army, but some scholars believe it was as early as the reign of King Hawegbaja, who ruled from 1645 until his death in 1685, and he was the first king to settle in the capital of Abaumi. Following King Hawegbaja's death, his oldest son, Akaba, ascended to the throne and ruled until his death in 1716, either during battle or as a result of smallpox. There wasn't really enough information to state one versus the other. Right. And it could honestly be both. It <laughs> could. It from bat battle and got smallpox. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. Following Akaba's death, his twin sister, Queen Tasi Ongbe, took the throne in 1716, although it's unclear if she merely acted as regent until Akaba's son could rule in 1718. Either way, she required a female guard to protect her within the palace walls, so at some point a squad of female warriors had to have been formed prior to 1716. It's believed that the Mino were a result of Queen Ongbe's rise to power. Nice. Ladies supporting ladies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the third king of Dahomey, King Agea, who ruled from 1718 until his death in 1740, had a group of elephant warriors known as the Gabeto as part of his army. Elephant warriors? So they rode elephants? No, which was another group of female warriors that did the hunting, not just of elephants, although they were the most valuable and difficult to kill. They hunted elephants? Yep. Damn. Like, why? Just for, like, can you eat elephants? You can eat elephant. But, like, you know, there's ivory, and I'm sure you can use their hides for a variety of things. I don't know. That makes me really sad. I've never killed an elephant, so I don't know. Thanks to the Gabetto, elephants were almost eradicated from West Africa by the mid-19th century. Oh my god. And their military forces were later integrated into what would become the Mino. Their uniform consisted of brown blouses and brown and blue knee-length shorts. The uniform didn't change much over the years, and both men and women wore similar ensembles. Nice. Other rulers of note are Tegbesu, who ruled from 1740 to 1744, following a power struggle with his brother Agea. Kipongma, who ruled from 1744 until his death in 1789 from smallpox. Agonglo, who ruled from 1789 until his assassination on May 1st, 1797. Not great. And 
Adon Duzon, who ruled from 1797 to 1818 when he was overthrown by his half-brother, King Gizo. Just like in... Just like in Wakanda. (laughs) Wakanda. (laughs) Fucking Killmonger. (laughs) Hey, cuz. Only it was his brother. So be hey, bro. (laughs) When the rulers of Dahomey needed a larger fighting force, women would be armed, positioned at the back of the group, and would fight alongside the men. However, during the reign of King Gizo, who ruled from 1818 to 1858, a very visible female force had been established that was feared by the kingdom's neighbors. Nice. His son, Gleil, oversaw the golden age of Dahomeyan history from 1858 to 1889. By the mid-19th century, 30 to 40% of the entire army consisted of the Mino warriors. Nice. You go, girls. Ladies. Ladies. (laughs) The Dahomey rose to power as a militarized kingdom during the peak of the Atlantic slave trade, conquering the coastal kingdoms of Alada and Waida. In 1727, under the leadership of King Agea, they conquered the coastal kingdoms of Hueda and Savi and assumed control of the port city of Wida. Following their takeover, it became the main base of their operations. The kingdom of Dahomey had a slave trading economy. Stop. And each year when it wasn't Ah. farming season, they would go to war with their neighbors for the dual purpose of expanding and strengthening their kingdom and collecting people to add to their slave trade. Slave trade. Unfortunately... The Mino were part of this economic tradition and became a key player in the trafficking of Africans, which was their most profitable export to the British, French, Portuguese, and other nations. Well, this is disappointing. I mean, it gets better, (laughs) then it's going to get disappointing again. So this is a roller coaster ride. Okay. One small mercy was that it was against the rules established between the various kingdoms in Africa to enslave your own people. So they couldn't... <laughs> so just uh, they just had to enslave neighboring. Yes. Got they, it. They couldn't send their own people. So The enemy of... Mine enemy is my slave. Something. To yeah. sell. Something, yeah. Gross. Cool. Not cool. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. It's just, I don't know how to feel. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can feel not great about it because it's not great. It's really not great. It's estimated that between 1659 and 1863, almost one million Africans were put on ships bound for America from the port city of Wida, making it the second largest exporter of enslaved people. Awesome. As a result of the continuous raids that the Mino conducted against neighboring kingdoms, the number of males was reduced significantly, increasing the need for women to assume positions of power in the military. King Gizo assumed power after staging a coup against his half-brother, Abandazan. He partnered with a powerful Brazilian merchant and fellow enslaved trader named Francisco Felix de Sousa, who also set up in the city of Wida. He is often credited as forming the Mino, or at least militarizing them into the feared warriors they are known as today. Okay. It wasn't unusual for the women of Western Africa to hold positions of power. In addition to the Mino, there were female members of court to create a sense of balance between the two. What a novel concept. Right. Additionally... (laughs) The queen mother was considered equal to the king, so she could also put forth her own rulings. Agendas. Yep. Nice. It was known that the Mino would bring back the heads of those they had slain to their king as proof that they had taken lives. (laughs) The French viewed this as the height of primitivism and used it as justification for colonizing the area. Says the people who don't feed their pigs so they the pigs eat their children's faces. I know. I know. You guys ate bone bread. Shut up. <laughs> You're preaching to the choir. 
Not only this, but the French were horrified by the Mino's flagrant disregard for, quote, gender roles and what women were supposed to do in a civilized society, end quote. Gross. To the European nation, the Mino people needed to be educated on proper societal ideals. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Men good, women bad. Yep. Got it. Good. Shut mouth, make baby. Mm. Yes, yes. Cook food. Cook bread with bones. Mm -hmm. Yes. Make sexy times. Shit. In Dahomey, the Mino would reenact their battles for their king and any visitors to his court. These reenactments were also a great source of entertainment, as the women would perform mock battles, including climbing atop the roofs to catch flaming items. Nice. According to French colonials who were lucky enough to view such performances, it was quite the sight. Yeah, lucky enough. Yeah. You nasties. Mm-hmm. So how did one become an elite warrior such as Amino? The women weren't allowed to marry, have children, or have sex. In fact, many of them were virgins. Right. They also had to endure intense and demanding training and were encouraged to harness and use any rage or aggression when in the heat of battle. Which is why they didn't have sex. Got it. Yep. <laughs> the exercises were meant to harden them so they wouldn't be affected by bloodshed. It wasn't uncommon for them to take their machetes or swords, then lop off the heads of condemned prisoners to desensitize themselves. They're like a badass version of a nun. Yes. If the pendulum swung the other way for a nun. Mm -hmm. Assassination nuns. Yeah. The Mino would use weapons they got from foreign nations as part of the trade, such as muskets. In the 19th century, they would have been armed with Winchester rifles, clubs, and knives. Mock assaults were also part of the training, including hand-to-hand -hand combat, and recruits were forced to climb high walls of acacia thorns barefoot to desensitize themselves to pain. Gross. The bravest of the recruits would be gifted a belt of acacia thorns to mark their status. It is very nun-like and almost like Christianic, like the self-flagellation mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. You self-flagellated yourself the best. <laughs> yeah. The Mino consisted of five unique branches, huntresses, Rifle women, reapers, archers, and gunners. Reapers? Oof. The oldest unit, the huntresses, wore a band of iron crowned with two antelope horns, which symbolized nice. their power, strength, and flexibility. They were often armed with curved daggers and long rifles. Scary. So these were the ones that, once upon a time, would have been the elephant killers got it the gabetto the rifle women made up the largest branch of the mino each would be armed with a long rifle short sword and were trained in close combat some were armed with spears and their uniform included a belt made of banana leaves that held their ammunition nice the good use of a leaf right banana leaves are thick too so that would yeah. be perfect mm-hmm the rest of their uniform consisted of a blue blouse, white and blue striped culottes, and a white skull cap that had a blue caiman on it. Nice. Very smart. Mm hmm The archers, as you can imagine, were equipped with bows and arrows, as well as daggers. This smaller unit was made up of only the best archers, who would use poisoned arrows. Ooh, Okay. As guns started to replace bows and arrows in the 19th century, their roles changed to that of those transporting weapons as well as transporting the wounded and dead away from the battlefield. Their uniform consisted of the same skull cap as the rifle women and a short blue tunic. Okay. The Reapers were some of the smallest in number, but as their name implies, they were the most deadly and feared. Armed with razor-sharp knives that could cleave a man in two with a single blow. Oh my god. Their weapon, which looked like a hooked machete and required two hands to use, weighed 22 pounds, or 10 kilograms, 
and was 18 inches or 45 centimeters in length. Damn. Due to how fearsome they looked, they tended to be the front lines in any attack to freak out their enemies. I bet they did a good job of that. (laughs) Yeah. One of the most famous of the Reapers was a woman named Sedung Hungbe, who led the group into battle. The last group, the Gunners, made up around a fifth of the female soldiers. Their weapons included 17th century iron guns, dice, German Krupp cannons, and large caliber blunderbusses that could only shoot short range. Dang. Their uniform consisted of a red and blue blouse and culottes. It was essential that the Mino be able to sneak undetected into the villages of their enemies before dawn in order to take captives and dispose of the ones that refused to go quietly. Nice. (laughs) An American missionary noted that they were, quote, the scourge and terror of the whole surrounding country, always at war and generally victorious, end quote. Author Torild Scard noted of the Mino, quote, They were renowned for their zeal and ferocity. The most fearsome were armed with rifles. There were also archers, hunters, and spies. They exercised regularly to be physically and mentally fit for combat. They sang, Men, men stay. May the men stay. May they raise corn and grow palm trees. We go to war. (laughs) Did the French hear it? Did the French hear that part? (laughs) I think the French should have heard that song. When not in combat, they guarded the royal palaces in Abomi and grew fruit and vegetables. They could also go out and take captives to sell as, in, as slaves, end quote. Yeah. Many of the recruits were formerly enslaved, had been captured from neighboring kingdoms. Some as young as eight were from the lower class, were formerly one of the king's wives. The king's had like hundreds of wives. <laughs> so if he's done with you, you just go kill people. You could. You could just be like, <laughs> you know, instead of just hanging out in this palace all day, I kind of rather just be out murdering people. And then right. he'd be like, cool. Have I'm at done it. having sex with you. I'm gonna go murder. Yep. <laughs> Bye. You're not <laughs> yet spending enough time with me. I'm gonna go murder people now. <laughs> Love you. Bye. Or girls who exhibited rebellious behaviors and were forced into service by their fathers or brothers. Ew. All of the members of the Mino were considered a hosi, or third-class wives of the reigning king. They lived in the palace alongside his actual wives, and the only males that were allowed to live in the palace were the king himself and the eunuchs that made up his court. According to oral tradition, and this is a trigger warning, It's believed that the recruits were subjected to female genital mutilation, but I only saw that noted in one spot, so I don't quite know how to to, to take that. I don't know. I think it could potentially be something, especially if they wanted them to not have sex. Yeah. Or be enticed by it. Yeah. So, And if he had a court of eunuchs. Yeah. So. Indicator. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Okay. As members of an elite class and considered married to the king, although they did not have sex with him or any other men, the Mino enjoyed privileges befitting their station, such as wealth, unfettered access to alcohol and tobacco, nice, which was a privilege not even granted to men, not to mention they were able to have their own enslaved servants, sometimes up to 50 per warrior. Jeez. What would you have them do? I don't know what they had them do. Sir Richard Burton, who visited the kingdom of Dahomey in the 1860s, noted the following about the Mino. Quote, when Amazons walked out of the palace, they were preceded by a slave girl carrying a bell. The sound told every male to get out of their path, retire a certain distance, and look the other way. End quote. Yeah, don't <laughs> hope it's not a reaper. Yeah. Well, <laughs> look at me. Yes. 22 pounds of pain. <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> at the height of their power, their numbers were in the 6,000s. Wow. Unlike other kingdoms in West Africa, the Mino continued to exist as a standing army, even outside times of conflict. 
They also wore uniforms along with their male peers to set themselves apart as a force to be feared and respected. Nice. Starting in the 1830s, the Dahomey and other kingdoms throughout Africa ceased their involvement in the slave trade and instead focused their efforts on the export of palm oil, which was a popular ingredient in soap making in Europe. King Gizo continued the export of enslaved peoples between the 1830s and 1840s, because although the price of the enslaved had lowered significantly, it was still more profitable than the export of palm oil. Yeah. In 1852, King Gizo finally agreed to stop participating in the trade of the enslaved after receiving pressure from the British government, who had abolished the practice of enslavement in their colonies in 1833. So he waited, like, almost 20 years. <laughs> He's like, mm, but, like, money. And then he was finally like, okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> That's so messed up. The Minos' military prowess started to falter in the later half of the 19th century when they continued to fail to capture Abiokuta, the Egba capital, in what is today southwestern Nigeria. In a battle with Egba in 1851, who had taken over the region after the Oyo Empire declined, 2,000 Mino perished. Wow. So, big oh, wow. deal. Wow. That's big a huge deal. deal. It was a devastating battle. In 1863, the French declared the kingdom of Porto Novo, which was a neighboring kingdom of Dahomey, a colonial protectorate. This action greatly angered King Gleel, who viewed Porto Novo as a vassal of his kingdom. As a result, the king's forces fought with the French over Porto Novo's port city of Cotonou. 1864 saw King Gleil launch another attack on Abiokuta that resulted in the Mino having to retreat after just an hour and a half of fighting. That's so insane. Despite the fact that Abiokuta was heavily fortified, the Dahomey continued to target Egba villages until 1890, when a new threat presented itself. On February 21st, 1890, the first franco dahomeyan War began, just two months after King Galeel's son Kondo ascended the throne and assumed the name of the Hazen at the age of 45. Late king. He took over because his father had completed suicide after their last failed attack. You know, as horrible as this sounds, I could see that because I can imagine that would be incredibly embarrassing and dishonorable if they've like never retreated ever in their history and, and under his tutelage, they retreated twice. Yeah. I'm thinking that's why that happened. That would have been devastating mm -hmm. for that, that time period and that, and potentially that, you know, community. Mm hmm Prior to this, France had been attempting civilizing missions in the area, exploiting the land and people of West Africa due to the barbarity of their culture, as we have. Oh, barbarity, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. They're just savages, you know. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. Blech. Yeah. God, I even hated saying that word. <laughs> okay. On March 4th, 1890, the Dahomeyan forces launched an attack on the French at the port city of Cotonou. They unfortunately fell at the hands of the French, and amongst the dead, Mino, was a fierce teenage warrior named Naniska. Jean Bayle, a French naval officer, noted that she had managed to decapitate a chief gunner before dying in battle. Of her body, he noted that a, quote, cleaver, its curved blade engraved with fetish symbols, was attached to her left wrist by a small cord, and her right hand was clenched round the barrel of her carbine covered with cowries, end quote. Her, her. A year prior to the war, he had encountered Naniska during her training. Of this event, he stated, quote, she walked jauntily up, swung her sword three times with both hands, then calmly cut the last flesh that attached the head to the trunk. She uh -huh. then squeezed the blood off her weapon and swallowed it, end quote. Dang. So that just kind of shows you a little, like, just how badass they were. Yeah. yeah. And how, like, fierce they were as warriors. 
in their training. Yep. Another battle took place between France and the Mino on April 20th in what is known as the Battle of Atchupa, where a peace treaty was made in which Dahomey conceded to the French's control over Porto Novo and the city of Cotonou. Peace lasted around two years, and during that time, King Bahazin gathered weapons that either matched or exceeded those of the French. When the French declared war once again in the fall of 1892, King Bahazin stated, quote, The first time I was ignorant of how to make war, but now uh-huh. I know. If you want war, I am ready. I wouldn't stop even if it lasted 100 years and killed 20,000 of my men, end quote. Kid. Over the course of seven weeks, the Mino army fought in 23 separate battles against the French earning them the respect of the European colonizers. A French Marine later noted, quote, Neither the cannons, nor the canister shot, nor the salvo fire stops them. It is really strange to see women so well led, so well disciplined, end quote. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. Surprise. Idiots. <laughs> God. Although the actual numbers are unclear, Historians believe that between 1,200 and 2,500 Mino fought in the Second Franco-Dahomean War. That's not a lot. No. Especially when you consider they once were at 6,000. Yep. That's what I was thinking of. But we also don't know how many died in the battles where they were trying to take that one city. The colony, yeah. Yeah, so we don't know how many died. On October 6th, 1892... The Mino faced their greatest defeat at the village of Adagon. Of the 434 women who set out that day, only 17 returned. Oh my god. It was following this loss that King Bahazin started to realize that the destruction of their kingdom was a foregone conclusion. Bad. The Dahomey launched a last stand at Kana in early November against the French and the Foreign Legion. A French Marine colonel noted that the last day of fighting was, quote, one of the most murderous, end quote. I bet. Because they knew that they were going down. Mm -hmm. Nothing to lose. Yeah. Especially considering the fact that the French Foreign Legion had machine guns and many of the Mino were slaughtered within the first couple hours in hand-to-hand combat when they were charged by the French with their bayonets. The Mino remained a significant military force until the French officially seized the kingdom's capital of Abomey on November 17, 1892, denoting it as a French protectorate, which made King Bahazin the 11th and last king of Dahomey. During the course of those seven weeks, between 2,000 and 4,000 Dahomean men and women died in battle. In regards to the Mino, of which 1,200 were ready to fight at the start of the war, only 50 or 60 remained following their surrender. You see. These numbers are remarkable if you consider that the French only lost 52 Europeans and 33 Africans in battle. That's insane. Mm-hmm. Following the fall of Dahomey, the remaining Mino either followed their king to Martinique, where he lived in exile until his death on December 10, 1906, or served his brother, Aguli Agbo, who the French had installed as a puppet ruler on January 15, 1894. Many of the Mino who chose to stay to protect Aguli Agbo disguised themselves as his wives in order to do so. Nice. And s- some even went on to have children. Some of the Mino did their best to re-enter society, with some traveling to either Europe or the United States, where they performed dances and battle reenactments. Cool. A famous example of this is an exhibit they had during the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. <laughs> she didn't stay at H.H. H. Helms house, did she? <laughs> I don't think they did. You know, if they did, he probably would have been stopped. Probably. They they could have stopped H.H. Holmes. God damn it. (laughs) 
where they had giant signs showcasing the Mino, which each holding a severed head. Nice. It's also believed that some even ended up as part of Buffalo Bill's Wild West shows, but I couldn't find enough documentation to kind of confirm that, just like... Maybe like a one-off or something? Yeah, because at the time that this happened, like, the 1890s were kind of when his shows were starting to kind of do a down a downturn. Papala. Like he was all he was done in 1913. Like that's when he was like, I'm yeah. bankrupt. I'm bankrupt. I can't do this anymore. So if they were, it wasn't for like very long. Yeah. Following the fall of Dahomey, the French colonizers barred women from any positions of power or personal development, including education, politics, and of course, serving in the military. They suck so hard. Oh my god. In November 1979, Nawi, the last known surviving Mino warrior who fought the French in 1892, oh passed away. Well over 100 years old, she had been interviewed the year prior in the village of Quinta by a Beninese historian to learn more about her life and the lives of the Mino. Descendants of Queen Angbe also continued to live in and around the former Dahomey capital city of Abaomi, a movie that is very loosely based on the Mino called The Woman King was produced starring Viola Davis and Lupita, is it Nyango? Nyango, yeah. Nyango, which as of this recording, you can view on Netflix. Yeah. There are also several other pop culture references to the Mino, such as books, movies, and television. Nice. And that is the story of the Mino, a.k.a. the Dahomey Amazons. Awesome. So it's like, they're good, they're bad, they're good. You know, it's kind of... Yeah, it's a toss-up. It's a roller coaster type of thing. So if you're interested in ad-free content, consider supporting us with a one-time donation either over on Buy Me a Coffee or our Venmo page, both of which are in our link tree and in the show notes. If you'd like early ad-free content, not to mention some bonus material, become a member of our Patreon today for as low as a dollar a month. Hey y'all, it's Damini, woo-woo scaredy cat and host of your new favorite podcast, None of This is Real. And this is the other one, Sarah, your resident flexible skeptic. We'd like to invite you to sit down on the front porch swing and tumble down a rabbit hole or two with us. We talk about all things mysterious and weird, like hauntings, cults, and urban legends, cryptids, science, and conspiracy theories. And then we ask each other the ultimate question. Is, is any, any of, of that, that real? real? So whether you're a believer, like me, or a skeptic like me, or a little bit of both, listen every Tuesday. Subscribe to None of This Is Real wherever you listen to podcasts. And always remember, you don't have to believe anything we ever say. But you do have to believe on yourself. Believe, believe all, all over, over yourself. yourself. On a lighter note, this week's podcast plug is the None of This Is Real podcast. Each week, hosts Sarah and Damini pick one of their favorite topics and discuss the mystical side and the scientific side. Whether you're a believer or a skeptic, you'll be asking yourself, is any of this real? They are also members of the USA Network. Nice. So I'm right. What is something good you'd like to share? This past Friday was my 14th diabetes anniversary. Damn. Right? So... For those of you who don't know, there's something that certain type 1 diabetics do, or you, I think type 2s might do it too, I don't know, but diabetics in general, as a way to not be sad and like traumatized by the day you were diagnosed and your life was forever changed, you celebrate it instead of curse it. And lots of people call it a diaversary instead of a diabetesversary, but I think diaversary sounds really aggressive and negative, mm. and I love diabetesversary, so that's what I call it. And it has been 14 years since I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and it has forever changed my life, but there have been really good things that have come out of it. So 
I celebrated by making like the best triple chocolate cupcakes mm-hmm. with salted caramel frosting. I made it from scratch mm-hmm. and they were delicious. And yeah, it was just a nice little day. What about you? What's one good thing? So we didn't really plan anything for our parents' birthdays. We were just kind of like, hi, Man, happy yeah. birthday. And it was for like a variety of reasons, which is, is fine. <laughs> right. It wasn't because we're bad children. It's because of financial situational Thanks. issues. And I was trying to find and think of a fun thing that we could all do like together as like an experience. So today I booked a high tea <laughs> event at yeah. a, a town near us for our mom, us, and my daughters to just have go and have like a tea party essentially. Yep. I had taken my Girl Scout troop there like two years ago. It was in like 2021, I think we went. And it's really cute. It's really fun. They use nice antique china and stuff and they make their own like clotted cream for their scones. It's delicious and (laughs) it's fun. And I was like, this would be a fun thing for all of us to do together. So I reserved our spot for that uh, so very exciting i'm excited to go i've never been yeah. to a high tea before it's not for a couple months it's like towards the end of april but it'll be a good time it'll be a great time we just need to find some fancy hats we have time we have all the time in the world and on that note let's shut her down it's shut it down looking for more content you can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com If you'd like to see pictures from this week's episode, not to mention bonus content and funny memes, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Yield Crime Pod and on Facebook and Instagram at Yield Crime Podcast. On TikTok, of course you are. Follow us at Yield Crime Podcast. A great way to support the show if you want to help out but you can't do so financially is to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, or wherever you can leave us a rating. This week's come from Apple Podcast from our friend Chelsea, and it says, Longtime listener, I've been listening since early 2021, and every episode gets better and better. My favorite is still the episode about spooky Victorian children gave me (laughs) chills. Amazing. I love history and true crime, and Lindsay and Madison always find the most fascinating stories to tell. That's all, Lindsay, but thank you. Thanks, Chelsea. Uh, Thank you. If you want a playlist of all our episodes on YouTube, click the link in our show notes or in our link tree and subscribe today for not only a list of our full catalog, but a separate list as well, just of our Can You Crack the Cramp Word segments. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale. As of this crime. Has there ever been a time where you wondered about something and thought to yourself, wow, I really should know this? Whether it be something as serious as the water shortage our world is facing or the future of digital real estate, or maybe something as strange as the origins of the Mandela effect, or what does Michelin have to do with food, or if lizard people actually exist. Whatever it may be, we got you covered. But that's not all. We turn it into one big drinking game. Welcome to Shots and Thoughts, the internet's only educational improv comedy game show involving shots of liquor and D20s. We're learning what you should already know so you don't have to.